Shana Tova. Do you know how amusement parks decide on an acceptable height limit for roller coaster riders? Experience. Personally, I've never been much of a roller coaster guy. I just repeat three words over and over again until the ride is over. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> But as many of you know, when you're sitting in the hospital, your mind goes to crazy places. And as I sat there in the hospital this past winter at my mother's side, a memory popped into my head from when I was a young teenager. It was a beautiful spring day, and my parents took my younger brother and me to a carnival. Among the attractions was something called the Gravitron. I was just tall enough and just bra barely brave enough for my first amusement park experience. For those not familiar with the Gravitron, the ride is a completely enclosed sphere in which riders simply lean against the inside walls. The ride then rotates, at first slowly and then faster and faster, creating a centrifugal force so strong that it allows riders to stick to the walls without their feet even touching the ground. And there are no safety belts to keep you up. In that moment when the ride is twirling fast enough and the centrifugal force is pushing against you hard enough, so you hope, the base of the ride lowers and the riders remain suspended against the wall while speeding round and round in circles. In other words, what was my very first carnival ride experience? The room began spinning and the floor dropped out from underneath us. It occurs to me that this pretty much sums up this last year. The room has been spinning and the floor has dropped out from underneath us. It was a hard winter in the Starr family. Out of the blue, mom suffered a heart attack. The doctors diagnosed dad with a serious skin cancer. I know that it was a hard year in many of your families too, and in our synagogue family. Too many of us have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. We mourn the passing of children and parents, spouses and siblings, grandparents and friends. We lost our synagogue president, I, Matthew Miller, a blessed memory. Many of us or our family suffered their own illnesses and injury. The room has been spinning and the floor has dropped out from underneath us. It's been a hard year for the Jewish people as a whole. War in Israel, anti-Semitism in the United States, Canada, and Europe. I hope that it's okay, but I want to defer our conversation about Israel until Kol Nidre night, and to focus today on the significant anti-Semitism that we've experienced as American Jews, especially in these last 12 months. For American Jewry, the room has been slowly starting to spin over the last 20 years, slowly enough that we barely even noticed. But in the last few years, and especially in the last 12 months, the room sped up rapidly, and the floor dropped out beneath us. We are pinned against the walls, disoriented, incredulous, exasperated, infuriated. Some of us are pretty scared, and there are no seatbelts to be found. When we're in the hospital room alongside a gravely ill loved one, we notice that our loved one doesn't often look like themselves. Covered with wires and cords, discolored, a hospital gown hanging off their body in a most undignified manner. The patient appears a shadow of their former self. It occurs to me that like a patient in health crisis, this America in which we are currently living doesn't feel like the America that I thought I knew. This America doesn't look like the one to which my grandparents were welcomed as immigrants, in which they built a life, a home, a family. This America doesn't look like the one in which my parents worked their way through college so that they could give my brother and me an even bigger step up. Now with our own child currently applying to college and another one, God willing, doing so in just a few years, 
This America upon which I gaze certainly doesn't look today like the one I hoped they would inherit. We're looking at an America that is deeply and profoundly ailing. For a long time now, we as Jews have kept an eye on our friend America's heart. As given her genetic makeup, she is predisposed to blockages coming from the ideological far right that can strike hard and strike suddenly. We expect Jew hatred from the right. For decades, we've been fighting against fascism, white supremacy, and neo-Nazis. Right-wing extremism foments fear and hatred in order to manipulate and exert control over others. Right-wing extremists seek to murder and to maim. Over the last many years, with the rise of social media, the proliferation of punditry, and the invention of entertainment journalism, the heart attack of right-wing anti-Semitism continues to be a risk, and they are feeling particularly emboldened in the moment. Because our focus has been on the heart, though, we forgot to keep our eyes on the cancer that is left-wing anti-Semitism. And indeed, for decades, the cancer of left-wing anti-Semitism has been slowly growing and metastasizing within the body of our friend America. The biggest tumors are located on our college campuses, and the effect has been a profound clouding of the minds of students, journalists, politicians, government staffers, union activists, and minority communities. The anti-Semitism coming from the radical left feels more personal, too, because it comes from those whom we thought were our friends and those with whom we marched in solidarity. Our longtime allies are seemingly no more. Certainly, anti-Semitism manifests as violence and vandalism. We don't need to look far for examples. As right here in Southfield, a Jewish regent of the University of Michigan had his law offices attacked, and in Ann Arbor, a Michigan student was assaulted for being Jewish. And I just heard, I just heard that last night, a rabbi with the JRC in Ann Arbor was hosting 20 University of Michigan students for a Rosh Hashanah dinner and a gunman entered the house. As far as I know, thank God, there were no injuries. A miracle. And it's not just violence and vandalism. It is at least damaging ignorance and perhaps Jew hatred too, when Israel's detractors engage in hypocrisy and double standards against the Jewish state. For example, when Israel is criticized for killing too many civilians, and at the same time criticized for a well-placed bomb that eliminated a single Hamas terrorist hiding in Iran, it might be anti-Semitism. When progressives decry inequality and discrimination in America, while at the same time insisting the United States support the most regressive ideologies in the Middle East, it might be anti-Semitism. And when our universities and colleges fail to consistently apply speech and expression rules, leaving Jewish students vulnerable in a way that we would not and should not tolerate for others, it might be anti-Semitism. Now, I believe in the importance of free speech, even when it makes us uncomfortable. In fact, discomfort helps us to grow, even when the criticism is about Israel or about Judaism. But it is most certainly anti-Semitism when our children are made unsafe because of their beliefs. Perhaps this cancer feels more threatening than the heart attack at this moment because it manifests itself most acutely against our col Jewish college students. I know that they're young adults, but they're also our kids. Perhaps this anti-Semitism feels worse because we American Jews saw colleges and universities as our vehicles to success and acceptance in America. And now it seems that the pursuit of independent thinking and critical analysis is under assault. What will be for American Jews or for Israel if in 10 years or 30 years those who are protesting today are the ones advising our elected officials? What will it mean for the rest of America if they only hear the anti-Israel side of the argument? The American body is terribly sick, and the truth is that threats against the Jews are coming from both extremes. Whether you lean left or you lean right, we are either naive or negligent if we ignore our own extreme and assume the other side poses the greater risk. 
The extreme left and the extreme right have much in common with each other. Both are gaining footholds. Both are impacting the November election. Both are dangerous. We need not yet call in hospice on the America we know and love. But drastic steps need to be taken to nurse America back to health. And we Jews provide far better healing to those in need when we all work together against a common enemy rather than pointing fingers at each other in blame. We know how to respond when a loved one is in the hospital. And I wonder if that wisdom might be beneficial as we enter this new year to try to heal an ailing America. The Torah tells us that when the prophetess Miriam became sick with leprosy, Moses cried out a simple five-word prayer. Dear God, please heal her. And Miriam was healed. At the synagogue, we add our loved one's name to the Mishaberach list, and when we daven, we include their names in the prayer for healing. It's good to come to the synagogue when a friend or family member needs healing. It's good to be part of a community during these difficult times. Through prayer, there is strength and comfort in directing our fears and our concerns heavenward. In addition to calling out to God when a loved one is sick, we advocate on their behalf by doing everything that we can to seek help. We call on doctors and nurses, friends and extended family to get involved. We document our loved one's treatment to ensure that they're receiving adequate care. I worry, though, that as it pertains to Jew hatred in America, we've spent much time talking about the illness within our family, but we fail to adequately call out to the people who can truly help. With our ballots, with our keyboards, with our voices, I think that each of us can become better advocates for fighting against anti-Semitism in this country. When sitting there in the hospital room last winter, or in my darkest moments over the last year as I heard about yet another encampment turned violent or threatening, calls for genocide against the Jews, I found myself often thinking about my grandfather, a blessed memory, Wolf Gruca, the Holocaust survivor whom you so lovingly welcomed here as part of the Shah Tzedek family. Even before Grandpa died a few years ago, he was already warning me that growing anti-Semitism and the political landscape in America remind him of pre-war Europe. I remember, too, Grandpa telling me that in Poland, on Yom Kippur 1939, with Germany preparing to invade, the synagogue gathered for the High Holy Days. On that Kol Nidre night, not only were the women crying, Grandpa told me in his thick Polish accent. And not only were the men crying, but even the walls were crying. This year, that story took on a different meaning for me. In 1939, there were some rabbis in Germany and Europe who read the writing on the wall. They encouraged their synagogue families to immigrate to America or to pre-state Israel. Most rabbis just assumed, with regard to the growing Jew hatred, this too shall pass. In full disclosure, in my darkest moments over the last 12 months, I've wondered if I will have the foresight, or perhaps the courage, one day to suggest that we leave the United States. Will that be my role? Will that be our fate? It is said that to be a Jew is to live with your passport always at the ready. Yes, the American body is terribly sick. The proliferation of Jew hatred threatens the very foundations of this country. Drastic steps need to be taken to nurse America back to health, and I believe, I believe that we can, because there's so much about America that remains a blessing and that is worthy of our love the essence of America, that this is a place for all people to affirm life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is worthy of celebration. That this is a country in which the American dream can still come true requires that we continually and collectively work toward the protection of that ideal. America blessedly remains a country in which the systems and structures of justice, including the courts and the police, continue clear-minded, fair, and reasonable, and we must protect the courts we must ensure justice. And so far, thank God, America, by and large, rejects anti-Semitism, 
and supports Israel's right to exist as a Jewish democratic country. At the same time, we're wise to continue to invest in Jewish safety here in America and in Israel too. We're especially grateful to the Jewish Federation for all its incredible efforts. We appreciate those elected officials who procured government funding for houses of worship so that we can invest in greater security measures. We're indebted to the security guards and law enforcement who diligently protect us. And we all are grateful to our synagogue security committee for its hard work this year and every year. In addition, though, in response to the evil and injustice of our times, I believe that we should all consider how we might better invest through money and especially time in the organizations and institutions that teach the joys of Jewish life, that educate about the depth of Jewish meaning, and that offer to Jewish children the wisdom of our ancestors, that tells us the beauty of our faith, the comfort of peoplehood, and the power of performing acts of loving kindness. I hope this year and in the coming years to see that Hillel Day School, the Frankel Jewish Academy, synagogue, religious schools, and Jewish summer camps receive a tidal wave of enrollment and donations coming their way. I hope that Hillel's on college campuses will expand the number of students they're serving. I hope too that each of you might consider how you can join in what is being called the Jewish surge, the increase in pride and participation among Jews as a response to the growing evil of our day. After all, even with the compassion that we justly and rightly show to all peoples, we would do well to remember that in the event of cabin pressure change, we're instructed to place the masks over our own mouth first and only then to place them on others. The most successful approach to standing up to anti-Semitism is simply to do more Jewish. The best way for us to show our strength is to invest in Jewish life. The way that we will outlast and overcome those who seek our destruction is to live with profound Jewish joy. Every time that we kindle Shabbat or holiday candles, we're bringing Jewish light into a dark world. Every time that we show up at the synagogue, we are proclaiming that it is faith and not fear that will guide us. Every time we sing the Hanukkah blessings, make noise to blot out Haman's name, and gather around the table for a Passover Seder, we are reclaiming Jewish resilience. And every time we wear a Magen David necklace or other Jewish symbol, we are announcing our pride in who we are and what we believe. Every time we celebrate a Jewish wedding, a bris or a baby naming, or a child becoming a bar or bat mitzvah, we are proclaiming to the world that we cherish our Jewish future. In that way, looking at this beautiful room today, and mindful that millions of Jews around the world are gathering for prayer and celebration. I have three words for all who oppose the Jewish people. Am Yisrael Chai. I have three words for everyone who seeks to deny us our rights to life and land. Am Yisrael Chai. I have three words for every Father Coughlin and every Henry Ford, for every Hamas supporter and Israel hater, for every radicalized left-winger and extremist right-winger who seek to silence us or to make us afraid, Am Yisrael Chai. To every Jewish college student who is nervous to affix a mezuzah or is anxious to speak out for Israel's right to exist, let us together remind them, Am Yisrael Chai. History proves that in whatever country the Jewish people live and thrive, so too does the country live and thrive. Let us say, Am Yisrael Chai. And wherever and whenever the Jewish people gather to pray, to learn, to work for justice, and to celebrate the blessings of life and freedom that God has given us, we will together in one voice yell, Am Yisrael Chai! Am Yisrael Chai! Am Yisrael Chai! On the Gravitron, after some time, the floor comes back up. The ride slows down and you exit with a big smile on your face and a hard lesson about physics in your kishkas. <laughs> but you walk out. And after a difficult winter and a spring full of visits to the doctor, mom and dad are here today with the clean bill of health to celebrate the new year. Thank God. With the right care, 
with hard work, with some mazel, some luck, and with plenty of faith and hope, healing can come. Those are three words too. Healing can come. Healing can come for us and for the United States. So on this Rosh Hashanah, I have yet three more words. God bless America. God bless America. God bless America. And one more time, let us declare, Am Yisrael Chai. Shana Tova may it be a good, sweet, peaceful year for Israel, for America, and for us all. And let us say together, Amen, and Am Yisrael Chai.